writes his name. His, this guy, his name's Greg. And um, he, he gets his canvas to memorize. And usually people get it within a day, get it within two days. Guess how long it took him? It took him four full days. But that's not all. It didn't just take him that long. He decided that from the time that he received the canvas to memorize until the time that he memorized, memorized it, he wasn't going to eat. He was fasting. So for four days straight, this guy ate nothing. The only thing he did was drink water. So he was like, you know what? I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to leave this up to the Lord. He's, he, he speaks so mellow. It's so funny just to hear this guy. He's like, I'm going to leave it to the Lord. I'm going to fast. And I'm going to memorize this by the grace of God. And it took him four days. And when, after you're done with the first canvas, you actually have a second one. The second one's shorter, but we got it, he got it down, and everybody was like, yeah, we're all celebrating. Like, whoa, you got your canvas. Everybody started clapping. He's like, yeah. And then the leader gives him another one. He's like, mercy, I have to fast again. <laughs> and we're like, dude, you killed yourself. Like, no, you're good. Just keep it in prayer. You'll, you'll get it. But um, this guy, um, he goes out. This was just this week that this happened. He's canvassing, and then he gets to this guy's door. And... There's a, you guys are probably familiar with this or not, but there's a sign that says no soliciting. Now for canvassers, that can be one of the biggest fears, one of the biggest things that could scare you because they don't want anything that re needs, that represents anything as salesmen. But we don't like to refer ourselves as salesmen, we're soulsmen, because we're not there to sell, we're there to win souls. So what, what he, he gets to this door that has that, and uh, the guy, he starts, uh, well, we're encouraged, we, we, we have this rule where we don't share any negativity because we just share positive t positivity, but I'm going to share this part just to let you guys know what happens next. So the guy opens the door, he's like, can't you read the sign? Like, get out of my house. Like, yeah, like I don't want no solicitors, no salesmen, da, da, da. And he, he tried to show him some books and the guy was just, just like, no, like, I don't want anything, just leave. So he ends up leaving. And he, he, he goes, and what he ends up doing is he knocks on these doors, and he starts praying, and then he, he gets this conviction upon him. He just, something just dawns on him. You know what? In his mind, he was like, you know what? I feel like I should go to this guy's door and just leave him an apology. Because I don't want to leave this door representing corporates, representing Jesus as someone who is a salesman. So he goes back to the door with the guy that just yelled at him. He knocks on the door. The guy's like, didn't I just tell you to get out of here? He's like, sir, sir, I am so sorry. I just wanted to ask you for forgiveness. Like, I just, I just wanted to apologize if I offended you in any way, shape, or form. He's like, I told you to just get out of here. And he's like, he doesn't tell him any, he like doesn't forgive him anything. He's like, sir, I just, I just wanted to say I'm sorry. And the guy just like, no, I don't care. Just get out of here. He's like, all right, sir, God bless you. I'm praying for you. God loves you and he just walks away so at that point he's a little like discouraged and he ends up praying for this guy and that day there was actually a word he had a he was actually reading in his devotions on job on how he should pray for others and not himself and we encourage our students that sometimes when they're struggling out there in the field, that they do something. Is that instead of praying for themselves, that they pray for other people. So what this guy did was he started to pray for other people. He started to pray for other students. And as soon as he left that door, he knocks on the other door. And this lady is just unnaturally kind to this guy. And then boom, she gets two books. He goes to the next few doors. Bam, more books are going out. Bam, like more and more, like throughout the whole entire day, he noticed that the more he prayed for others, the more people were willing to, re to receive his books and they were more receptive and he noticed something different that happened. Is the moment he stopped praying for himself, God started to bless him in a way he'd never seen him blessed before. This guy had like an average about two books a day, a whole entire day, two books. Now. If I can just introduce 
or just sum it down for you guys, two books is almost nothing in a whole entire day. We start from 12, have an hour break, and then end around 9. Two books is almost nothing. Now, the day that he decided to do this, guess how many books he had? He got 18 books in that day. James chapter 5, verse 16, the second part says, first part says, confess your faults to one another, second part, and do what for one another? Pray for one another. That you may be healed, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Something powerful takes place when you pray for other people. I'm going to share a testimony, and I'm just going to base the worship off of that. So, <clears throat> I've shared my testimony here before, right? You guys know a bit of my story, but the way that I came into the church is I grew up Catholic, and we were heavy Catholics. We would, you know, go to church. I mean, we're mostly traditional Catholics, but... When we went, we were, it, we, were, we were really all there. My mom was like really engraved in us to believe in God. She, that's something that we grew up with. God was, was a big part of our lives. He was existent. And um, one thing my mom hated was every year, the number one time that she hated out of the entire year was the summer. Now, she didn't live in El Centro, so she had another reason to hate the summer, okay? I'm just kidding. Okay. So my dad would work throughout the day, and then he would come back at night. And my mom would obviously take care of us. She would pick us up from school. Um, and when the summers came along, there was four of us. When the summers came along, my mom didn't have us at school. She had us there at the house the entire time. So me and my, my siblings, we weren't very nice to each other. We would fight a lot. We would really, we would say such really harsh words to each other. There was, it was not a loving home because God wasn't present there. So my mom, it was the most hectic time for her because here she was, she had to deal with these four kids. And you know, like when, when the dad comes in and the kids are like scared, they're like, oh, like the dad's here, you know, like the mom, she has some authority, but when the dad comes in, it's like a whole different story, you know? So my mom was left alone. Some of you guys are laughing. I know you can relate with that. <laughs> so my mom was left the entire day with like the little authority, authority that she had until my dad came in and then he would come in and spank us. But the entire day my mom was left with us. Four kids, fighting all the time, and she could only do so much. She got to a point <clears throat> where she was just desperate for us to change. Because the home that we lived in, it was full of hate. We just didn't care about each other. We would just fight. We would give the, just the worst words to each other. And all of this was because of the things that we would watch. We would play a bunch of video games. It was all violence. All of, these, all of these things had influence on our lives. Now, my mom had no idea what to do with us. She tried everything. She tried yelling at us. She, she couldn't control us. And at that point, she, just, she would come to tears. And she would, every single night, my dad would come back. They would always fight because my, my, my dad told my mom that she couldn't control the kids. And then he came in. He had to spank us. And it was the same thing day in and day out. Now, imagine a home like that. How unhappy is that? Every, almost every single day to have that. One day, my mom goes into... Uh, Cardenas? You guys have Cardenas here, right? Yeah, okay. Just checking, just checking. She goes into this Cardenas, it's a Mexican grocery store, and there's these people handing out glow. And there's this man that comes up to her, hands her a glow, and asks her for Bible studies. And my mom automatically, in her mind, she thinks about us, about her kids. She asks the man, do you do Bible studies for kids? And this man says, yeah, of course, we can, do, we can do Bible studies for kids. She's like, yeah, I want my kids to know more about God. I want them to be in the right path. They're not on the right path. I want them to study the Bible. I want them to get closer to God. So the man says, yeah, she signs up. Um, and this is something unique that happened because you guys ever had somebody else come up to you, like uh, another evangelist or, you know, someone else from another religion, they, you know, kind of ask you. Well, my mom's one of those people that if you ask her something, it's really hard for her to say no. 
So, and we get this as, as well as co-porters. The number one thing when we knock on, on Mexicans, uh, Hispanic people's homes, is they don't say, I'm not interested. They just say, oh, no tengo dinero. Or, ah, para la otra. Can you come the other time? Like, we're not going to come back. But they just say that because they just can't, it's, it's, I don't know, it's something in the culture. We just, it, they have a hard time saying no. So every time these people would offer my mom, evangelists would offer my mom Bible studies or anything, she would never say no. Instead, what she would put is as she was writing the number, her phone number, everything was accurate until the very last one. She wrote like a completely different one. And then on the address, she had a different street, a different number, and a different house. So, because it was so hard for her to say no. Now, when this happened, when this guy came up to her, it was like a miracle. She put all the right numbers, and then the last one, she wrote the right one. And the address, she wrote the same street, the, the exact same number of the house, address was on point. So this time, she agreed, she said yes. So then we get a lady coming in, giving us Bible studies. And my mom, her whole purpose of this was for us to be converted. We were still Catholics. All of us were Catholics. She wasn't in the church. We weren't in the church. No, nobody was in the church. She was just wanting this to happen for us. In that whole process, what ended up happening is as we were getting Bible studies, I mean, we were kids. We don't really listen. We didn't really understand anything. But in that whole process, my mom was listening to these Bible studies. Instead of us being converted, she, become, she became converted to the Adventist message. She started listening about the state of the dead. And at that point, my grandfather had actually just died. When she realized that, she was like, wow, how come nobody taught us this? How come nobody else is teaching this? So everything, all of her plans completely became reversed. She wanted us to get converted, but then, bam, she's the one that gets converted. Oh, man, when my mom got converted. It was a whole other story for us, man. We were used to watching TV and all the cartoons, man. All the cartoons, all the good shows came out. Guess when? Friday night and Saturday morning. And when my mom became an Adventist, started keeping the Sabbath, guess what out? Guess what went out the door for us? We didn't watch no more TV on Friday or on Saturday. Oof. Oh, you should have seen us. We're heated, man. We're like, what? You mean these people go to church on Saturday, but like Friday is still like, they want to take Friday away from us. What? And then my mom eventually starts telling us to come, and, and then eventually she has to drag us to church on Saturday. And we're like, all right, fine, we'll go. Now imagine, growing up, you go to church for one hour. Or, or mass for one hour when I came to the Adventist church it was like three hours and I was like these people are crazy what in the world how can they be in church for so long it's literally three full hours like what can they do and we're just sitting there you know they put us through Sabbath school and then the whole message we're just sitting there and we'd always like mess with, like just tell my mom like oh we want to go we're just like so grouchy all the time and one thing I remember my mom always doing it took her seven years to do this, okay? Seven years. When she would bring us to Wednesday night prayer meeting, they would have this time where they're like, okay, does any have, anybody have any prayer requests, anything they can ask for? My mom always sitting down. She'd always be one of the first ones to raise her hand. She's like, yeah, I mean, I have my kids right here. If you guys can just continue to pray for my kids, pray that they may come to get to know God. And every single Wednesday, she always stood up and it was just, I was like, mom, please, like, I'm so tired of you just calling, like, just calling us out in front of everybody. Like, why do you have to do this? Every single Wednesday, there was not one Wednesday that I remember not being there where she would always ask the church to pray for her kids. And I remember one thing that my mom always did one thing she always did was pray. What she did was she wanted to start praying in the night together. So she got us all together. She's like, all right, we're going to pray. And she was the only one praying. 
And oh my, my mom's prayers went on forever, man. After like a week, we're like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm trying to avoid it. I'm trying to pretend like I'm sleeping, man. Like she would come knock on our door and we're like. And then like she, she wouldn't like she wouldn't wake us up to pray. So we would do that so she wouldn't pray because she would pray for so long. But one thing that I remember about my mom is James 5.17. Pray for one another. The effectual prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. My mom, when it came to prayer, she did not quit. She saw her children, she saw her kids, and she saw the wickedness of this world. And one thing she did continually was pray. Pray for us. I was in fifth grade. Now just imagine seven years of the same thing every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year for seven years straight until I was a junior in high school. That's when I got baptized and that's when I did the co-porting program. It took my mom seven years, seven years of prayer. How many of you guys here are parents today? Okay, we got some new ones here. Welcome. <laughs> Seven years. Now, is that a long time? Yes or no? Yes. Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Short verse, but it has such a profound meaning. First Thessalonians 5.17, it says, Do what? Pray. Pray. With ceasing? Without ceasing. I don't think we understand this very much this morning. The Bible here tells us pray without ceasing. In other words, pray without giving up. Too often, we bring our request to God, and if He doesn't answer within a week, we let that request go. But let me tell you something. Before you lose your faith in God, you're going to lose your patience in God. Patience is what we need. Revelation 14, 12 says what? Here lies the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments. Patience. Patience. We must continue to pray without giving up. Amen. Seven years. She continued to do that. Turn back to James chapter 5. Book of James chapter 5. last part that I want to bring out from this verse it says the effectual fervent prayer of a what righteous man avails much righteous what does that word mean is that somebody that's not living up to the standards that God has revealed to them this is someone that's living up okay let me just bring something else out when my mom came into the church she was all in man she dropped everything cold turkey now one thing that my mom loves to do and she's really good at is she loves to cook. How many of you guys love to cook? Okay, a few of us, right? Good amount of us. Jeff, I didn't know you cook. Man, all right. Probably taste some of your dishes in potluck, right? Okay, so my mom liked to cook. She cooked really good and we loved, we really like to eat. Now when she found out about the health message, oof, oh my good, okay. So they took away TV and all this stuff, but when they took away the food, it was just like, oof, they just stepped on some, like, really, mm, they were on some, they were on some thin ice, man, for us. We're like, I can't believe them, man. Now we can't even eat pepperoni with pizza. This is ridiculous. And then my mom, she would make, she would make shrimp sometimes too, right? And shrimp was actually one of my favorite foods that she would make. 
when she stopped making that, I was like, Mom, I can't. What are you doing? I really, I was like, this is like brainwash at this point. This is ridiculous. Like, you're taking away some of the best tasting food. Like, are you kidding? Like, what more do you want, man? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Do you want your prayers to be effective? You have to live a righteous life. If my mom would have just been praying, but living her life as if nothing she, she heard existed, or if she just heard it and just went through one ear and went out the other, she would not have been living a righteous life. But because my mom prayed, because she prayed consistently without ceasing, and because she lived a righteous life, her prayers weren't just weak prayers. Her prayers availed much. Her prayers had effect. Because when you live a life righteous to God, your prayers are much more powerful than when you're just a normal Christian not even following what God told you. We wonder sometimes why God doesn't answer our prayers or why our prayers aren't so effective. But here the Bible tells us something. That the prayers of a righteous man or righteous woman avails much. Do you want your prayers to have more effect? Live a righteous life. Let me tell you something. If my mom would have given in to us Given into our arguments, given into our complainings and murmurings about the food and about the TV channels, guess what would have happened? I don't think I would have been here today. But because my mom was faithful to what she learned, her prayers, they had effect and they were powerful. Her prayers, they did something. It took seven years. But when those seven years came, it made a dramatic change in all of our lives. If we are not stepping our foot with our kids, if we're letting our kids tell us what to do, and we know what's right, God has given us a solemn res us. God has given parents us. I'm not a parent. I'm not a parent. God has given parents a solemn responsibility with their kids. If you're not the one educating them, guess what else is? Either the television, their phones, or their school is educating them. The best place for education, it begins in the home, church. The home is going to be the number one influencer, the number one educator for your children. If my mom would have never stepped her foot, if my mom would have never offended us with all these things, we would have never been in the point we're in right now. Think about it this way. If your son or someone, if your loved one is hanging off of a cliff and you ran just in time to grab their hand, and you had to squeeze their hand to pull them right up. If not, they would have fell. And you, their hand started slipping from you. And what you had to do was pull a tighter grip on it. And it started to pain their hand. It started to hurt them. Would you let it go because it was hurting them? No. You would squeeze on tighter because you know no matter how much it hurts right now, you're saving their lives. My mom understood that. No matter how bad it hurted us at that moment, she was doing something good for us. She knew that the tighter she held on, eventually she was gonna pull us out of that dark life that we were living. And because of that today, I can say that me, myself, and my entire family are baptized and are committed into the church. We now walk with Jesus. It's a simple message. There's just two things. Three things. Is that you pray for one another. Pray for other people. If a church does not pray for each other, the church will soon die. Guaranteed. If we are not living on our knees, we will not be a living church. Pray for one another. The second thing is a prayer of a righteous avails much. If we're praying it out, but we're not living it out, our prayers aren't going to have much effect. And the third thing is, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. 
Some of us like to cook here, right, Jeff? Jeff, what's the best dish you've ever made? Oh, okay. Oh, man, he, has to, he needs to make a whole pot like just for us, huh? Okay. Okay, I, I asked him what's his favorite dish. He's like, man, there's, I don't know, there's just a lot. There's a lot of good ones, so. Oh, man, I want to try his food now, man. Okay, so what's, okay, just choose, choose one. Choose one of your favorite ones, like a really good one. Okay, pizza. How many of you guys like pizza? Yes, I think everybody loves pizza, right? Okay, let's say you make an amazing pizza, like a big one, right? Like a big fat one, man. One that all of us can partake of, okay? Let's say you make a big pizza, and it's like the best, you chose the best ingredients, you chose like the best diet cheese or, you know, vegan cheese, or if you guys aren't vegan, just put on normal cheese. You chose the best ingredients, you had some of them even shipped from foreign countries so you can have the best taste. Now you make this pizza, it's not just really good, it didn't take you a lot of time, but it was very expensive. Would you take that pizza once you finished it? And just go to the trash and throw it away? Doesn't make sense, right? It's the same with the church. We don't just hear a message and say amen and agree with it and then they go home and don't even live it. Why would you go and make something so amazing so you don't even partake of it and you just throw it away? What matters is not so much what I said this morning. It's what the church decides to do with it afterwards. What are we going to do as a church?